Hello friends, and thank you as always for visiting the Legend Sports Universe YouTube channel, Legend Sports Universe, where legends play forever. This is the Franchise Stars Baseball League Awards Show for year two of the FSBL. We'll go down the six major awards, both Rookie of the Years, both Outstanding Pitcher Awards, and both Most Valuable Players to bring to a close what was an outstanding year two of the Franchise Stars Baseball League. I greatly appreciate everyone supporting the project. FSBL, year one had a lot to live up to, but year two was up for the task, and we can't wait to get started with year three. Year three will begin sometime by the end of January. It'll be towards the end of the month, but we will get year three up and running in short order. So we're going to kind of go through this. This isn't going to take too long, uh, but I do want to go and do these do these awards and um, be able to chat with people a little bit about them. And we did polls. Um, I posted polls in a couple of places, most notably here in the community section here on the YouTube channel. Appreciate people weighing in on that. I've always kind of been hesitant to kind of put it up to polls because I think people put their own personal team rooting interests kind of ahead of the stats sometimes and that happened a little bit here but I think the results kind of ended up um, the way that they should so appreciate you joining me let's get to the awards and we will start out with the American League Rookie of the Year so your three finalists for the American League Rookie of the Year honor Jeff Bagwell from the Houston Astros the slugging first baseman a terrific season for the Astros, who did not have a terrific season, the Astros went 72 and 90, and everybody in that American League West has a long way to go to try to catch up with the juggernaut Oakland A's. But Bagwell will certainly be a part of the Astros' attempt to climb into contention in that division, and more likely for a wild card spot down the line. Addie Joss of the Cleveland Indians had a fantastic rookie campaign that took him deep into the postseason where the Cleveland Indians ultimately fell in the World Series to the San Francisco Giants. And Boog Powell gets a nod for the Baltimore Orioles as the third finalist. Probably could have made the argument that Eddie Plank probably should have gotten the third honor there. I chose the Rookie of the Year finalist based on the three finalists listed in MLB The Show. But um, Eddie Plank of the A's had an outstanding season and certainly could have um, could have been put into this list as well, as could Kenny Lofton um, and a couple of other guys as well. But Boog Powell for the Baltimore Orioles. The Orioles ended up 82-80, and 80, which is a very good showing for them in that division with the Red Sox and the Yankees. So the Orioles got above the 500 mark. They finished six games short of a playoff spot, but the Orioles have the basis of something good going there in Baltimore, and Powell will certainly help that out. We'll check out the individual stats for the players here as we go through the list before revealing the winner. We'll go alphabetically, and we open up with Jeff Bagwell. Bagwell famously homered in the opening day broadcast for the Astros against the Angels and really never looked back from that point. 43 homers, 130 RBIs, a 313 average. He added 10 stolen bases on the year. His 7.6 war put him fifth in the American League. He was also fifth in walks. He was third in homers, third in runs batted in. So just an outstanding rookie campaign for Bagwell, certainly earning his keep on this list. And we'll see what he can do for an encore when year three gets underway. Up next, we have right-hander Addy Joss. The Cleveland Indians lost in the American League Championship Series in year one of the FSBL. They made the World Series before falling the Giants in year two, and Joss was a big reason for that climb. Joss went 22-5, and five, a 2.44 earned run average, and even one whip. 255 innings, he was a workhorse, and he was dominant while he was at it. He led the league in whip, he led the league in innings, he led the league in wins and complete games, and was second in ERA, narrowly being edged out by the Oakland A's Eddie Plank, also a rookie. Um, the American League had a bunch of really solid rookie pitchers, between Joss, Plank, Whitey Ford, who also won 20 games. Um, Ford certainly could have been on this list again ahead of Boog Powell. The game selection there was a little bit was a little bit uh, a little bit questionable. Love Boog Powell, but he probably should not have been the third guy on that list. But a fantastic season for Addy Joss. 
And the last of our American League contenders, Boo Powell. Powell, 36 homers, 84 runs batted in. Those 36 homers had him tied for eighth in the American League. Powell only played in 110 games. So I feel like him making the finalist list may have been part of the system kind of extrapolating him out over over a full season. Um, he missed some time during the year. I actually think, I don't remember if it was because of an injury or because he was a late call-up. But Powell gets the third finalist position here in the American League. It's certainly a fine rookie campaign for Powell. Powell, again, you know, the 84 RBIs, the OPS, just over 900. So he put together a fine, fine campaign. Um, but I just don't really feel like he probably should have been a guy who who made this list. The fact that this is, you know, on a television award show, <laughs> you wouldn't say, ah, he probably doesn't belong. But I have that luxury here because I run the show. So, um, but, uh, but certainly a fine rookie campaign for Boog Powell. And with that, we get to your winner of the American League Rookie of the Year with 64% of the vote, Addie Joss of the Cleveland Indians. Again, the Indians stepped up from a year ago. They had a fine year one in the FSBL, making the American League Championship Series. They won the AL pennant here in year two. Joss, of course, a big reason why. Led the league in wins, led the league in innings pitched, led the league in complete games with 11, led the league in whip was second in ERA. Hard to argue with the choice of your American League Rookie of the Year, Addy Joss. If you're not familiar with Joss, take a look at his baseball reference page. Take a look at Sabre as well for a bio on him. One of the more uh, interesting and, and somewhat tragic stories in baseball history. So your American League Rookie of the Year for year two of the FSBL is Addy Joss. We get to your National League Rookie of the Year finalists, and we've got a great trio here, starting with Dizzy Dean. Dean led the St. Louis Cardinals to a repeat appearance in the National League Championship Series. He was terrific all season. Chuck Klein of the Philadelphia Phillies also gets nomination. Klein, a fine rookie campaign for the Phillies. The Phillies had a bit of a disappointing season. They hung around for a while. They ultimately did break the 500 mark. They finished 82 and 80. And adding Klein to that lineup, a big reason why. Again, the Phillies, not a sensational opening draw in the FSBL, but Klein has started their climb as they try to overtake the Expos and Mets atop that division. And also from the National League East, Gary Sheffield. And Sheffield, the Marlins went 79 and 83, and they hung around for a while this year. They had a great draft uh, as far as rookie pitchers last year. They added Sandy Alcantara and Jose Fernandez. But the lineup got a big boost from Gary Sheffield. And Sheffield kind of had a residual impact there because he helped give protection to Hanley Ramirez, who had an exceptional year for the Marlins with Sheffield protecting him, batting behind him. We'll get to their individual stats here in a moment as we go down the list. So we open up with Dizzy Dean, the lean right-hander for the Cardinals, was terrific. He was also able to kind of make up for the fact that Bob Gibson didn't really pitch up to his expected level during the regular season. But the Cardinals were able to win the division, and then Dean and Gibson showed signs in the postseason of what a formidable one-two punch they can be. Dean won 20 games, tied for the National League lead. He led the league in innings with 244, led the league in strikeouts with 257 was third in earned run average and among the leaders in whip as well. I don't, I, I apologize. I forgot to, you know what, let me bring this up for one second on my personal screen here. Dean was second in whip um, in the National League, a tick below Ed Morris, who ended up leading the league in the category. But certainly a terrific season for Dizzy Dean, well-deserving of a nomination for National League. Up next... The Phillies' Chuck Klein, and Klein gave a big jolt to this Phillies lineup. And if the rest of the Phillies lineup had played to their potentials this season, the Phillies are probably a playoff team. The Phillies had down years from Scott Rowland and Jimmy Rollins, who hit 241 and 252 respectfully. Richie Ashburn only batted 252 this season. So there was kind of a collective downslide for the Phillies lineup, other than Klein and Slide and Billy Hamilton, who led the way 
for Philadelphia. But Klein, 38 homers, 107 RBIs, a 306 average. He slugged 600 during the season. Added 11 steals. His OPS was 907. So just a terrific season for Klein. And if his teammates can kind of come back to form a bit in year three, the Phillies could find themselves fighting for a playoff position. Lastly, we head to the Florida Marlins and Gary Sheffield. And Sheffield, an outstanding rookie year as well. 43 homers, 107 runs batted in. He batted 283, scored 87 runs, posted a 916 OPS. Um, and the, the biggest advantage that Sheffield provided to the Marlins was, again, bolstering Hanley Ramirez. Ramirez probably should have ended up in the MVP conversation a little more than he was. We'll get to that award uh, coming up in a bit. But Ramirez ended up with 40 homers and 111 RBIs, batting 307, far surpassing his first year numbers. He saw a 30% increase in batting average. His homers improved. He drove in 20-plus more runs in year two. Um, and a big function of that, big reason for that, was having Sheffield batting behind him. So Sheffield, a huge reason for the Marlins' improvement during the course of of this season from last year. Again, that National League East, no, the only team that got a really good draw out of the gate. The Mets got a good draw. The Expos got a great draw given their history. Um, and everybody else kind of had some, had some gaps. So the Marlins were able to kind of make significant strides this season. Um, Sheffield tied for second in the league in home runs with 43. He was fourth in the league in runs batted in. So a terrific opening campaign for one of the most vicious hitters you're ever going to see, Gary Sheffield of the Marlins. And with that, your National League Rookie of the Year winner with 83% of the final tally, Dizzy Dean of the St. Louis Cardinals. Hard to argue with that one despite the fine seasons from Klein and Sheffield, but Dizzy Dean... Again, led the league or was in top two of virtually every pitching category. And Dean serving notice to the National League Central that the Cardinals are going to be very tough to deal with with Dean and Bob Gibson. Again, Gibson has not been Gibson-esque during the regular season in either of the first two years of the FSBL. If he ever writes that shit during the regular season, Gibson's been great in the playoffs. But if you can get Gibson to pitch Gibson-esque during the regular season alongside Dean. That is one of the most formidable, if not the most formidable, one-two punches in the FSBL. We turn our attention now to the American League Outstanding Pitcher Award, where we have five finalists for the, uh, for the honor in each of the leagues. We'll go down the list quickly, and then we'll go through everybody's individual numbers. Lefty Grove... Of the Oakland A's, Addy Joss of the Cleveland Indians, Pedro Martinez of the Boston Red Sox, another rookie, Eddie Plank, who we mentioned earlier, probably should have been a finalist on that Rookie of the Year ballot, and yet another rookie. Rookies shined in the American League this year, particularly on the mound. Frank Tanana of the California Angels round out your five finalists for American League Outstanding Pitcher. First up, Lefty Grove. Grove went 19-4, 225 innings of work, struck out 235 over the course of the year. His 2.88 earned run average placed him ninth in the American League. Those 235 strikeouts led the league. He was third in wins, seventh in innings pitched. And Grove, Rube Waddell was the ace of the staff a year ago. And Waddell kind of took a little bit of a backslide here in year two. And Grove kind of picked up the slack there, improving his ERA from 3.6 to 2.88. He threw 13 more innings. He added 40 more strikeouts, um, lowered his home runs allowed, and went from 13 and 10 to 19 and 4 for the 111 win Oakland A's before the A's were eliminated in the American League Championship Series in an upset at the hands of the Cleveland Indians. Up next, Addy Joss of the Cleveland Indians, who now already has the American League Rookie of the Year award. 
to put on his mantle. We'll see if he can follow it up with the American League Outstanding Pitcher Award as well. Again, we won't go rehash everything, but 22-5, 255 innings, a 2.44 earned run average, a 1.0 whip. He led the league in most categories um, other than strikeouts. It's still that 169, a respectable total. But, you know, led in wins, led in innings, led in whips, second in the ERA, led in complete games. Just a fantastic season for the Indians' right-hander. Up next, we head to Boston and Pedro Martinez. Martinez, 17-9. 229 strikeouts in 227 innings, a 2.78 earned run average, a sparkling 1.05 whip. Martinez in the top five in virtually every category. He was fifth in earned run average. He led the league in shutouts. He was tied for third in strikeouts. He was fifth in innings pitched, was third in whip. So across the board, another terrific season for Pedro Martinez. Martinez was 12-8 and eight in his rookie campaign in year one of the FSBL with a 2.79 earned run average. He put up a 2.78 this year, so the model of consistency this time around, the other numbers looked a little bit more impressive, particularly the record. He went from 12-8 and eight in year one to 17-9 and nine in year two. Martinez, of course, would trade any nomination for this award to have back Game one of the ALCS, the Red Sox had a 10-0 lead. Pedro was unable, along with his bullpen, of course, to hold on to that lead in quite arguably the greatest game in FSBL history and ultimately led to the Indians leading to a series win over his Boston Red Sox. We head back out to Oakland and rookie left-hander Eddie Plank. Plank 15-9. 224 and a third innings pitched, 194 strikeouts, 2.37 earned run average that led the American League and a 1.11 whip. Again, Plank led the league in earned run average. He allowed the fewest homers of any qualifying starter. He was eighth in the league in strikeouts. He was second in complete games behind Joss. He was eighth in the league in innings pitched. And he was fifth in the league in whip. So a terrific season for Plank, who continues to just let the rich get richer out in Oakland with the rookie left-hander joining a vaunted Oakland A's rotation. And lastly, it's another rookie left-hander, the California Angels' Frank Tanana, 12-9, 230 in the third innings of work, 231 strikeouts, a 2.77 earned run average, and a 1.16 Whip for Tanana. Tanana fourth in earned run average in the league. He was also fourth in the league in shutouts. He was second in strikeouts. He was tied for third in complete games, second in innings. And he, the Angels missed the playoffs this year after making the wild card a year ago. But um, that was certainly nothing on the shoulders of Frank Tanana who will be continuing to try to help the Angels get back to the postseason in year three. And so your American League outstanding pitcher with 40% of the vote, Addy Joss, earns the outstanding pitcher award. He can put that as a bookend with his American League Rookie of the Year honor. Again, we've, we've already gone over the stats, so we don't need to kind of beat that horse here. But Addy Joss, about as good a rookie season as you can possibly imagine, in a year where rookie arms dominated the American League, Addy Joss proved himself to be the best of those. And the Indians now started their climb from the ALCS to a World Series appearance. We'll see if they can take that final step over the hump and win a World Series championship in year three. And so we head to the National League Outstanding Pitcher nominees. Again, five nominated for the National League honor as well. And this was a very impressive group, starting, of course, with your National League Rookie of the Year, Dizzy Dean of the Cardinals, Sandy Koufax of the Dodgers, Rube Marquardt of the San Francisco Giants, Ed Morris of the Pittsburgh Pirates, and Kurt Schilling of the Arizona Diamondbacks. 
we start off with Dean, who, as we did in the case of Addie Joss, we've already kind of gone over all those impressive numbers, but you can take a look again. 20-6, 244 innings led the league, 257 strikeouts led the league. The 1.03 whip was second, the 2.66 Earned run average was among the leaders as well. Just an outstanding rookie campaign for Dizzy Dean as he led the Cardinals to an NLCS appearance for the second straight year. Up next, left-hander Sandy Koufax for the LA Dodgers. Koufax 15 and 7, 222 and two-thirds innings of work, 252 strikeouts. That put him second in the National League, a 2.95 earned run average, a 1.26 whip. That strikeout figure, again, getting Koufax a nod here, but you saw a big improvement from Koufax from year one. Year one, he was 14 and 10 with a 3.73 earned run average. Respectable, but certainly not where Koufax wanted to be. Big improvements this year largely brought about by the fact that he cut his home runs allowed in half. Koufax allowed 30 homers in year one of the FSBL. He allowed only 15 here in year two, and that helped him shave that earned run average from 373 to 295. I would expect another climb from Koufax here. I'm looking for a big season from Sandy Koufax in year three as the Dodgers try for a return to the playoffs after missing out in year two. Up next, Rue Marquardt of your world champion San Francisco Giants. Marquardt, 20-7, 232 innings of work, 191 strikeouts, 3.14 earned run average, a 1.11 whip. And Marquardt, you know, some of those individual stats don't really quite seem to measure up, but Marquardt pitched clutch every time the Giants needed him to, not just in the postseason, but in the regular season as well. Marquardt, of course, best known for his appearance game seven in year one of the FSBL, not having started in two months, came on, forced into action to start the game seven, and he threw an absolute gem only to be dueled by Catfish Hunter's iconic two-hit complete game shutout performance in that game seven. But Marquardt threw seven scoreless going before uh, allowing the one run of that one nothing loss in the eighth. But Marquardt has established himself as a force in this league, and we will see if he can help lead the Giants to a repeat in year three. Up next, the most surprising pitcher on our list, I think, and certainly a fine pitcher historically, but Ed Morris. A fantastic year for the surprising Pittsburgh Pirates. Again, the Pirates, with a, given the, the players in their history, and who they have to draw from from their player pool. The Pirates got a horrendous draw um, starting off the FSBL, but um, and, and pitching has never been a Pirates' strong suit to begin with, but Morris put forth a, an outstanding season here. 18-6, and six, a 2.19 earned run average, which led the league. The 1.02 whip led the league as well, 242 innings, and Morris was a big, big part of the Pittsburgh Pirates earning that wild card spot before falling in dramatic fashion in extra innings to the Montreal Expos in the wild card game. But if Morris can kind of keep up anything remotely resembling this performance, the Pirates could find themselves back in the postseason in year three. The Arizona Diamondbacks stink. But that is not Kurt Schilling's fault as he and Randy Johnson have tried to keep that franchise afloat in this league over the first two years. But the Diamondbacks went 61-101 and here in year two. Schilling got 16 of those wins, 16-9, 232 innings, 181 strikeouts, his 2.52 earned run average, good for second in the National League. A 1.11 whip as well, so a fine performance for Kurt Schilling. No bloody sock, but a uh, <laughs> but a fine campaign for the Diamondbacks right-hander, part of their two-headed monster that doesn't really have anyone else around them. And with that, your winner for the National League outstanding pitcher, Dizzy Dean, gets the nod again. So Dean and Joss. Both earned Rookie of the Year 
and outstanding pitcher awards in their respective leagues. Dizzy Dean brings home 45% of the vote to take home the award in the National League. Um, your, your, your journalist kind of stuffed things for, for Sandy Koufax a bit. Koufax finished second. Koufax ended up with 32% of the vote. Um, but Dizzy Dean, certainly a, a superior season. And Dean, deserving winner of the National League Outstanding Pitcher. And that brings us to the Most Valuable Player Award. We'll start off in the American League. Your five finalists there. Jeff Bagwell, who we mentioned earlier as a nominee for Rookie of the Year in the American League. Bagwell, a fine campaign for the Astros. Jimmy Fox of the Oakland A's. Ken Griffey Jr. of the Seattle Mariners. And a pair of New York Yankees, Derek Jeter and Bernie Williams, round out our five MVP nominees in the AL. We start out with Jeff Bagwell of the Houston Astros. Again, as we mentioned before, a fantastic opening campaign for Bagwell. Fifth in the American League in war at 7.6. 43 homers, 130 RBIs, the 313 average. Bagwell ended up with 191 hits. He scored 110 runs as well. Did everything, just missing out on that 1,000 OPS. 997 final finger for him. He broke the 600 mark in slugging, almost a 400 OBP at 396. So certainly a standout campaign for the Astros rookie first baseman. Up next, the beast, Jimmy Fox of the Oakland A's. And what a campaign for Jimmy Fox. 50 homers, 140 runs batted in, a 335 batting average. The home runs and RBIs led the league. 335 was second. He missed out on the Triple Crown by the batting average category, falling to Derek Jeter, who took home the batting title at 340. We'll get to Jeter in a moment. But Fox was the war leader in the American League at 8.7, second in batting average, second in hits, first in homers, first in RBIs, first in runs scored. He was sixth in the league in walks. He led in on base percentage and slugging and OPS, the only American League player to break the 1,000 OPS mark. So just a standout campaign for Fox, who somehow managed to improve from a terrific opening year campaign. He went 328-43-120 in year one. And Fox, an even better performance in year two. Up next, it's Junior, Ken Griffey Jr. from the Seattle Mariners against the Mariners, looking uphill in a climb in that American League West. That's going to be a tough slog for them for years to come. The Mariners did, though, hover around 500 for a lot of the year. 78 and 84 for Seattle, and any success that the Mariners have is going to be tied to this man. Ken Griffey Jr., second in war behind Fox. He ended up with 44 home runs, 111 RBIs, 13 steals, a 295 average. That was second in home runs. Again, Griffey led all of baseball in home runs with 59 in the opening campaign. Griffey actually fell off a little bit this year from his MVP campaign in year one. Year one, 324, 59, 134, and just an outstanding outstanding performance. So he fell off a bit this year, but certainly 295, 44, 111 with gold glove quality defense out in center. Nothing to sneeze at as Junior places on the MVP finalist ballot. Up next, Derek Jeter of the New York Yankees. The Yankees finished second to the Red Sox in year one of the FSBL. They were dumped by the California Angels in a shocking blowout in the uh, wild card playing game. And then the Yankees rebounded here in year two. Jeter, a big reason for that. 340, he was the American League batting champion. 19 homers, 65 RBIs, 18 stolen bases. Jeter was third in the league in war at 7.9. Um, led the league in hits at 237, a runaway in that category. Jeter, 25 more hits than Fox, who was second. Jeter was also tied for the league lead in doubles. He was sixth in the league in runs with 103. So just a, a fine performance 
from Derek Jeter for the New York Yankees as he led them to a division title in year two. Up next, his fellow Yankee teammate, Bernie Williams. Williams, a fantastic second half of the year, led to a really nice all-around season for Bernie. 309, 36 homers, 108 RBIs. Jeter and Williams were able to stay healthy all year, which was certainly a huge help for the Yankees. But Bernie went on a power tear in the second half of the year, getting him to that 36 home run mark, which is a bit higher than where you're expecting Bernie Williams to be. You're expecting him to settle in somewhere in the 20s. But Williams in year one, he hit 302. He missed some time in, in the opening year of the FSBL. 10 homers, 39 RBIs, and 98 games. So Bernie broke out in a big way in year two. The Yankees will see if he can keep that up. As the Yankees still yet to make an ALCS um, through the first two years, which has been, been, been a bit surprising to some people. Pitching has kind of done them in. Although now with Whitey Ford, Ford got injured in September was hurt for the stretch run, and the Yankees did not have him in their playoff loss to the Indians in the division series. Um, but if Whitey Ford is healthy next year, the Gidry Ford 1-2 punch for the Yankees could get the Yankees a bit closer to a World Series appearance. And your winner for the American League Most Valuable Player, the Beast, Jimmy Fox, takes home the honor. Fox, 44% of the vote in what really I thought was going to be a landslide. You know, the, the, the Yankee ballot stuffers did their best to get Derek Jeter over the hump there. But Fox, again, just a, an incomparable season. He won two-thirds of the Triple Crown, led the league in virtually every category other than batting average where he was second. And it, it, would have been, it would have been difficult to deny Jimmy Fox the most valuable player as he clearly was the best player in the American League in year two of the FSBL. So we will close out the award show with the National League Most Valuable Player Award. And this has a list of five outstanding performances. One that I felt was going to be the kind of runaway and uh, in, in this situation, uh, they, they, got it, they got it right as he did kind of run away with the, uh, the biggest gap in the Most Valuable Player Award voting. But we'll go down the list here. Carlos Beltran of the New York Mets. Ken Boyer, who had a sensational season for the St. Louis Cardinals, stepping up in year two. Bryce Harper, another fantastic season. Harper runner-up in the Most Valuable Player Award voting a year ago. Willie Mays, who finished third a year ago in the MVP voting, is also on the list. Mays, of course, winning two-thirds of the Triple Crown in the American League, excuse me, in the National League this year. And Mays' teammate, Mel Ott. Ott, of course, broke out in a big way at the end of the postseason, doing Mel Ott things in leading the Giants to the FSFL World Series championship, but a fine regular season for Ott as well. We start in New York with Mets center fielder Carlos Beltran. Beltran, 30 homers, 106 runs batted in, a 326 batting average. The average a bit higher than you were expecting out of Beltran. Certainly a very capable player. Fourth in the National League in war during the season at 7.9. That 326 placed him fifth in the league in average. He was fifth in the league in hits. The 30, uh, the 30 home runs, certainly a respectable number. That RBI figure put him tied for sixth in the National League at 106 as well. Um, he added 95 runs that had him tied for ninth in the National League. So a really, really strong season out of Carlos Beltran as he led the New York Mets to a second straight postseason appearance. A big jump this season for the Cardinals' third baseman, Ken Boyer. Boyer, 335, 32 homers, 109 RBIs, played very solid defense at third base as well for the Redbirds. Boyer has not missed a game in two seasons, but you can see the climb for Ken Boyer. For a year ago, 278, 14 homers, 79 RBIs. This year, a huge climb in all categories. For Ken Boyer, he added 102 runs scored as well. 
just a fantastic season by Boyer. This is kind of about the peak of, um, I don't remember what year it was in Boyer's career, um, but he had his, his best season in his career. This is a little bit in line with that. The average is still a little bit higher. I think he was like 310 or something like that in his, in his best season, but he did the 30 homer, 100 RBI thing, if I remember right, in one season of his career. Um, the Cardinals will absolutely sign up for Boyer to be able to maintain that, but I'm not sure that you're going to see this kind of a season out of Boyer again. He will probably settle somewhere in between um, that year one and year two results, but all we're dealing with here is year two, and Ken Boyer was one of the best players in the National League. Up next, from the Montreal Expos, Bryce Harper. The Expos, a second straight playoff appearance as well. They were the NL East winners in year one of the FSBL. They took a wild card spot here in year two as the Mets won the division this time around. But Bryce Harper has led the way both years. 334, 36 homers, 119 RBIs for Harper. Harper, an 8.3 war, good for second in the National League. He was third in the league in batting average. He was third in the league in hits. He was second in the league in doubles. That home run figure had him 10th in the National League. Um, he led the league in runs batted in at 119. He was fourth in the league in runs. Just everything you could have asked for, Bryce Harper gave to the Nationals here in year two for another outstanding campaign for the Expos right fielder. Um, a year ago, another very consistent over the first two seasons for Harper. A year ago, 319, 44, and 121. This year, 334, 36, and 119. Um, over a 1,000 OPS for the second straight year for Bryce Harper. Next, we head to San Francisco. And instead of saying, hey, say wow, what a season for Willie Mays, 342, won the National League batting title, 49 homers, won the National League home run title, 106 RBIs, had him a bit down the list there. He was tied for sixth in the league in RBIs, all while missing time. Mays missed, um, he played 145 games during the season. He missed a little bit over two weeks with an MCL sprain that may very well have cost him that RBI title and the Triple Crown. But a fantastic performance from Mays. Mays an 11.6 war on the season. Not just an offensive powerhouse, but a defensive stalwart, of course, out there in center field. Um, just a, a great year all around for Mays. Led the league in average. Um, again, led the league in home runs. We've mentioned the RBIs, tied for sixth. He led the league in runs with 124 despite missing time. Um, his on-base percentage led the league at 429. He slugged over 700 and 1133 OPS for Willie Mays. To put things in perspective, that was more than 100 points higher than Harper, who was second. Just a phenomenal performance from Willie Mays. And last but certainly not least, Mays' outfield partner with the world champion San Francisco Giants, Mel Ott. Ott, 324, 41 homers, 106 RBIs on the season. His 8.1 war put him third in the National League. He was eighth in batting average. He was tied for seventh in hits. Fourth in the league in home runs. He was sixth in the league in runs batted in, third in runs scored. He was also fifth in the league in walks. Third in on-base percentage, fifth in slugging percentage, fourth in OPS, landing with an even 1,000 mark. Those are MVP numbers in virtually any season. We'll see if they prove to be MVP numbers here in year two of the FSBL. Let there be no doubt. The most valuable player in the National League in year two, Willie Mays, in an absolute landslide, 85% of the vote goes to the say hey kid who brings home the most valuable player honor again led the league in average led the league in home runs rbis the only thing that kept him from a triple crown campaign so the voters get these right as mays and fox clearly the best players in their respective 
leagues in year two, Willie Mays brings home his first of what I suspect will be several most valuable player awards in the Franchise Stars Baseball League. So that will wrap this up. I greatly appreciate everybody tuning in and, and not just to this broadcast, most importantly, just for helping make the Franchise Stars Baseball League um, the fun and the success that it has been over um, the first two seasons of, of the league over this past um, nine months or so since uh, the FSBL started. Year three will begin sometime by the end of January. I know I've been wrapped up with the Madden Football Project as I get that rolling. Um, but the Franchise Stars Baseball League, um, if I can devote a few days to that as soon as I finish the football project, um, I should be able to get the FSBO up and running. The only caveat to that is I do want to work. I do have some testing to do on um, the, the base running aggressiveness with slow players trying to score um, on balls that they shouldn't be. So I do have to do some testing on that, and um, I do want to see if I can get that um, addressed before I get year three going. But year three should be fun. We got some great talent coming to the league. Jackie Robinson, Josh Gibson joins the Toronto Blue Jays, which is awesome <laughs> and somewhat funny that the Blue Jays are the team that ended up with Josh Gibson. But uh, but that, that's going to be fun. We look forward to having Gibson and, and Jackie Robinson along with a bunch of other stars coming into the league for year three as well. Um, again, I noted this. I did a stream yesterday about plans for the Legend Sports Universe um, for 2024. And one of the things is going to be that I'm going to be doing stuff. I'm kind of tabling the website um, for now. As as And I, I like the website. I think the website came out great. But just getting stuff up and down to the website is very time-consuming. And I would much rather just be able to kind of take screen grabs and dumps and, and then be able to talk to people about stuff. So I'm using Discord. I've started a Discord server. I've pinned that to the top of the uh, the live chat here, and it's also in the video description as well. Um, I hope that people will subscribe to um, join joining the server. And it, I'm basically I'm going to put, it's going to kind of be a repository for everything. I'll be able to do quick hits on project updates as well, but it's really going to be kind of a place where I can dump stats and quick stories and discuss the um, the Lenin Sports Universe as a whole and the Franchise Stars Baseball League in particular with people. So hopefully you will join the Discord server there and um, and be, be part of that. But thank you guys, as always, for your support, your time, your friendship, and um, and your your love of, of, in the case of the FSBL, at least your, your love of baseball. Um, and uh, it's, it's greatly appreciative, and I love doing this, and you guys let me bring it to life. So I greatly appreciate that. Enjoy the rest of your night. Be good to each other, and we'll talk soon. And congratulations to the winners. Get ready for FSBL Year 3.